Welcome to Hot Chips 23. Session 9. Desktop CPUs. Okay, welcome to the final session of the conference. Uh, I'm Alan Smith, I'll be your session chairman today. Uh, we've got four speakers. Um, I, unfortunately, they're not wearing like, you know, red shirts versus blue shirts or, or black versus, well, two of them are wearing black shirts, but uh, the other side hasn't put on white shirts to compensate. So we, we've got our, our Intel speakers and our AMD speakers, and uh, we necessary we'll get the referees up here. Uh, so our first speaker is Oded Lempel, uh, who's going to be speaking on second-generation Intel Core processor family, the Intel Core i7, i5, and i3. Uh, he received his bachelor's in computer engineering and master's in computer science from the Technion. He then went to Intel in 1994. Uh, he was involved in the architecture of the MMX uh, instruction set. Those were the multi first version of the multimedia instructions. He worked on the microarchitecture and different design management levels, the multiple Intel microprocessors from the Pentium M, used for the initial Centrino platform, the Core 2 Duo, second generation Intel Core microarchitecture. Uh, formally, known, what he's going to be talking about is what's known as uh, Sandy Bridge or codenamed Sandy Bridge, in which he led the post silicon functional debug. His title is Senior Manager at Intel in the Microprocessor Chipset Division in Israel. Oded? Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Alan. Um, we will talk today. Um, good afternoon to everyone, um, at least those that are still awake after this uh, long uh, end of the week. Um, we'll talk about the second generation um, Intel Core processor micro architecture, and um, we'll see a little bit of the changes, the challenges that we had uh, in uh, designing it and planning it. Um, we'll go over some CPU uh, overview. We'll look at the major components that made the big difference between the previous platform, previous micro architecture, and the current one. Um, we'll look at a few core enhancements and ISA enhancements, and also uh, discuss a little bit about um, integration challenges that we had. First, a very high level overview on the system on chip platform and the difference between the 2010, the previous one, and the one that I am speaking of. Uh, on your um, uh, left hand side, you can see the previous platform and you can see the highlighted rectangle and within that you can see the traditional CPU and the traditional GMCH, or what was known once as the North Bridge. Um, and uh, they were in the same package in 2010. Previously, before that, they were even separate uh, dies on uh, uh, packages on the motherboard. And in 2011, the integration that we did the first time um, that we have done a, a monolithic integration of CPU and chipset on the same silicon uh, you can see the GMCH and the CPU combined on the same package. Um, we'll go over now um, the highlights of the new microarchitecture, then we'll go into the details um, one by one. So first of all, we'll look at the cores. We have uh, a new core microarchitecture. Um, all of them have the hyper-threading uh, technology. We have segments of four cores, two cores, four cores going with eight threads, two with going with four threads, and the most um, highlighted maybe change in the core is the new enhanced um, SIMD architecture, the uh, advanced vector extension called AVX. 
second part of the new microarchitecture is the high bandwidth and um, low latency for the last level cache, or we call it LLC. Okay, um, it is connected. It is connected. The LLC is connected to its agents through a high bandwidth, low latency uh, modular interconnect. The ring architecture, very similar, by the way, um, to the previous Paulson um, presentation. <clears throat> we also have the, the next generation processor graphics and uh, media engine, which we just heard about in the previous um, presentation. We have the system agent, or what was usually um, referred to as the MCH part that is integrated. Um, it's actually the IOs, the, uh, the DDR, um, uh, and the two DDR channels, and the integrated memory controller, and the PCI Express, and all the functionality that is leading from the CPU, from the uh, computational modules, to the IOs. And um, we also have um, a very uh, substantial power performance and power control unit that is in charge of the um, a turbo boost technology. I will not talk much about that. The next session um, goes into much more details on that. Overall, we have an integrated CPU, graphics, um, processor graphics, memory control, or PCI Express um, for the first time on the high volume mainstream client CPU. We'll start with the um, system agent part and all the IOs and, and, and actually the, the heart of the integration. So what were the challenges? Okay, the challenges we wanted to integrate um, the um, chipset with multi-core uh, integration. We required scalability. We wanted performance to scale to the level of integration. We have different levels of integration. We required robustness. Okay, we needed the bandwidth to scale with the number of uh, computational and the, uh, and the strength of the computation uh, engines that we put in. We wanted modularity in order to be able to use parts and modules in other components. The cores are used in our um, servers as well. We wanted to um, roll off and spin quite a few derivatives in a fast way, so we wanted this thing to be modular. And we required a very um, fine granularity power um, control, power controllability, uh, in order to get our performance and low power. <clears throat> the first part of the microarchitecture is the cache. We have a high bandwidth, last level cache. It is shared among um, all the cores and the processor graphics. Um, it is an inclusive multi-bank cache, 64 byte cache line, 16 way associative. Um, it is associated with the cores, what we call the slice, very similar once again to the Polson presentation that you heard before. And um, the cache size, of course, increases and scales with the number of cores due to this association uh, with the IA cores themselves. Um, it gives a significant performance boost. It also saves bandwidth uh, um, and power because we don't have to go to the DDR as much. And um, the addresses of the LLC are hashed among the slices. We have a short example here uh, on, on the screen. You can see that the uh, topmost core has a miss. It has a request. It needs to decode where, which slice, which bank of the LLC to get the data from. It goes to that bank. There was a question on the previous session. Can each core access any of the LLC banks? Then yes. Each one of them has an access to data in all of the banks. Okay, and once again, the core has a, um, the second core here has a, a miss. It needs to decode which LLC bank and it goes to that LLC bank and gets its data. Uh, an important part of the LLC banks is the cash box. This is the controller. This is the interface to each one of the agents connected to the LLC, whether it's the core, the graphics, uh, uh, or the ring itself, which we will talk about. It implements the logic, the, the cache logic, the ring logic, and the arbitration and hashing that I spoke of, um, and also speaks with the system agent for request to I.O. or snoops coming from the I.O. Um, it is fully pipelined. We can, hack we can actually uh, 
um, progress with a few requests at the same time. Um, it does the hashing. This is the reason to prevent hotspots and to get effectively more bandwidth from the cache itself. Okay, and because of the hashing and because um, of the ring protocol, which I'll speak in a second, it needs to maintain coherency and ordering between requests. Okay, an important part of the cache box is the power um, aspect of it. The cache itself is fully inclusive and all the snoops coming from uh, external agents can be um, actually uh, uh, dealt with in the cache box and we do not need to wake up the cores just to check for um, accesses. We do it only if we really need to. Um, the whole slice of the uh, core LLC and cache box work at the same frequency and same um, voltage as the IA cores themselves. Then we have the interconnect, the ring, um, in which uh, it is a, uh, a ring-based interconnect, once again, very similar to the Poulsen one. Okay, it connects the IA cores, the processor graphics, the LLCs, and the system agent. It is composed of four rings, a data ring, 32-byte, a request ring, a, an acknowledge ring, and a snoop ring. Um, you can assume that there's massive routing that this thing takes, but it is all routed above the LLC and has very little and actually no impact on the area of the die itself. Um, the ring protocol is such that any request can be accessed in the shortest path. The ring is, is just like a ring, okay, but it's not a round robin. You saw before in the examples, the top core wanted to go all the way down to the bottom uh, LLC bank. It went in the shortest way. Then there was the second to last IA core wanted to go up to one of the caches. It didn't go around as a round robin. It went through the shortest path. This is the protocol of the ring, okay? Um, we need to, uh, also a very important part of it is the modularity and scalability of the ring. It is used also in our um, uh, server products and it can scale very well um, to a large number of processors. The ring itself, due to the um, shortest path, can, act, can actually support out-of-order transactions because some transactions are longer than the other. So there is out-of-orderness, but the orderness, of course, has to be maintained. And that is also part of the ring protocol. And overall, uh, it is a QPI-based um, protocol uh, on the ring. To summarize this whole slice um, of the IA core, LLC, cash box, and ring, um, it gives us the robustness that we needed, it gives us the scalability that we need in terms of bandwidth and latency and performance and the modularity that we can actually do many flavors of uh, levels of scalability and also reuse this microarchitecture for all segments. Then we have the system agent. The system agent, uh, like I said, the uh, traditional MCH, uh, it, it contains the PCI Express, all the IOs, the PCI Extra Express, the DDR going to memory. It has an internal memory contor uh, controller. It has a display engine that is used um, uh, with the processor graphics. It is a uh, smart integration with the ring, okay? It enables very low latency from the computational engines to the memory, and it also is very efficient from the IOs um, uh, accessing either direct memory and snooping the uh, cores or um, uh, repeated conflicts of addresses going to memory. The um, system agent knows how to handle them efficiently. Um, and last but not least, power. There is um, a lot of power features in the system agent, mainly to shut down um, to different levels of idle power, uh, the IOs and the logic uh, related to them, and also um, a thermal throttling of the IOs. Overall, um, the system agent, we see it as a very efficient implementation for peripheral device integration. I won't go into all the details in, uh, in this foil, okay? Um, this is just to show that the Characteristic architecture of a chipset with multiple clock domains. It, it, you can see all the clock domains are different colors. Um, has, has to go into the leading edge technology, process technology. This is a complexity that we didn't have in the past, and this is one of the challenges that we had. In terms of power management, um, 
just like on the tip of, uh, uh, I won't talk about it much because the next session will go deeply into it. Um, we have separate power planes per module, per the system agent, the IA core and slice, and the processor graphics, okay? These um, different power planes and the multiple clock domains needed to be controlled, and the power management actually um, is a very fine-grained one, and the different power planes give us the agility to uh, speed up or slow down or go into idle states, the different uh, computational engines, and also the IOs. And like I said, um, next session we'll discuss this in much more details. I'll skip this one, if I may, and I'll go directly to the core enhancements, the IA core enhancements, okay? Like I said, we have four cores or uh, also segments of two cores. The uh, Sandy Bridge processor core is um, the, the main, main challenges of it and main um, target was to um, converge, to have it fit all the segments, mobile, desktop, and server, um, to be very good at power performance, and we had very strict criteria of what features we can put in. We had these cool features, which is performance to power is at least linear or better, and we have really cool features, meaning we have enhanced the performance and reduced the power at the same time. We also have, other than microarchitecture, we have ISA extensions, AVX being the most profound one. We have some extensions for security and also for OS and VMM-related functions. A very rough diagram of a um, IA core microarchitecture, we have at the top, we have the front end of the machine bringing in instructions, decoding them, and turning them into um, operations, or what we call micro-operations, or UOPs. These UOPs go into the out-of-order machine. They are allocated in the out-of-order space. They are renamed, uh, and then they are um, actually scheduled and issued into the execution units. And we have the execution units, the uh, uh, logic, arithmetic, and also the memory execution units at the bottom. Um, and what changes did we make to this structure? In the front end, we saw that we need higher um, UOP bandwidth for performance, and we did, and we gained that by a feature we call a decoded UOP cache. The decoded UOP cache holds UOPs uh, instructions that have already been decoded to UOPs, and we actually execute from that cache and not from the traditional instruction cache. This cache, this new pipeline that we inserted is shorter, thus giving us higher performance. It has all kinds of, it fixed all kinds of deficiencies in the legacy pipeline, giving us even more performance. And while we're operating and fetching from this uh, cache, we are shutting down the larger and longer pipeline, and thus we're saving much power. Overall, this is a very cool, very cool, really cool feature because it enhances performance and reduces power. Uh, I'm going to the other end of the pipeline. I'm going to the um, execution units, and here, um, the AVX extension, actually we doubled the data throughput of our um, SSC pipeline, and we um, widened them from 128-bit data to 256-bit. We took the registers, the XMM registers, all 16 of them, and, and expanded them to 256 bits. We have a new syntax uh, that is non-destructive uh, as uh, uh, different from the traditional IA2 uh, source uh, um, uh, syntax. Here we have uh, three operands, and we can do 256 multiply, add, and load per clock. And um, these new operations enhance all kinds of vectorization uh, applications, um, and we call this, we refer to this as a cool feature because um, the way it was implemented, and you'll see in the next two foils as well, um, it was done in such a way that, yes, we had to grow the machine, and we have a lot more power, but it is definitely um, linear to performance. The out-of-order cluster, in order to support the AVX extension, uh, what we did was we actually turned it upside down and we changed it completely. Um, instead, the previous generations, the data would flow with the operations through the pipeline, 
And what we have here, we have a physical register file. The data, if we would have needed to do the same thing, we would have actually doubled the interconnect power. What we did is we are leaving the data in the register file and we're just with the operations flow the pointers, the destination of uh, the location of the register file where the data is. It's much less data traversing through the pipeline and um, this really reduces a lot of power and it also lets us increase the uh, parallel window, the parallelism window and increase the ILP of the machine. So we get a very cool, uh, a cool feature that yes, it increases power, but it also increases performance and all, uh, overall the ratio is linear and it is a must for, to enable the AVX extension. Another uh, must change for the AVX extension is to um, actually sustain the memory bandwidth required by the uh, uh, doubling the data width. So we had to add another load pipeline uh, to the machine and so we now uh, can have 256-bit loads in the same cycle. We added a port um, to the memory machine. This, once again, shows all the places where we changed in the core. In terms of architectural change, we added uh, additional architectural extensions, uh, ISA extensions. We have extensions to um, speed up the throughput of cryptology instructions through the uh, AES instruction set. We have uh, additional, um, I would call them tweaks, smaller changes in arithmetic throughput enhancements, and we have some OS changes that um, can more optimally save our context um, uh, for the OS when we um, context switch. In terms of integration challenges, um, first and foremost was the process technology challenge. Um, we have Different modules for the first time integrated on one piece of silicon, and these different modules architecturally require different process, different transistors. We have the IA core that we want as much performance as we can possibly get. We need fast processor. We need a fast process for performance. On the other hand, for power, we need a low leakage. Um, for active power, we need a low leakage process. Uh, in terms of idle power, it's not an issue for the process because we have C state residency and we actually take the IA cores into deep C states, so we do not have an idle power issue. Um, for the processor graphics, we need more or less the same thing. We need a very fast process for performance, but because the leakage is a much larger factor, we need an ultra low leakage uh, process for, for uh, power, for active power. Once again, idle is not an issue due to C-state residency. For the system agent, we don't need that much performance, um, so we do not need a fast process, but we need an ultra-low leakage one because it's mostly on and we want to reduce the power as much as possible. So you can see these different characteristics, excuse me, um, require different transistors, and what we eventually um, did, we put together um, a, an advanced manufacturing technology to enable different transistors on the same die through the same processes of HVM and testing, okay? And we also did, um, we, we saw that by uh, reducing, lowering the P1 guaranteed frequency, we can get overall better performance, and this you will hear about in the next session. Another challenge in the, in the integration is all the new IOs and analog devices that are required to be in such a uh, integrated CPU, okay? Um, we have much more IOs. We have, much, we have many clock domains requiring uh, PLLs, and all these um, put a very, very a complex a challenge on the implementation of such a CPU. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, the IOs do not scale well from generation to generation, and the IOs themselves um, require higher a higher voltage and higher power than power supply than um, the uh, digital parts. And for this, what we had to do, we had to come up with a very strict architectural criteria on which IOs come to the leading edge technology CPU and which one remain in the PCH, in the South Bridge. Okay, overall we had to come with a trade-off between power performance of integrating versus the complexity 
uh, in which we um, had to maintain as well. To summarize, um, the second generation core microarchitecture is a 32 nanometer pro on a 32 nanometer process. Um, it integrates the IA core with a processor graphics, with a system agent, ring architecture, and other innovations required to make a very optimal um, integration. We have ISA extensions, most profound the AVX extension. We have very sophisticated power management that gives us very good performance and very, uh, uh, makes this uh, product very power efficient. Thank you. Nathan, we can count on you. Uh, by the way, in case you haven't looked at the proceedings, there are a lot more slides in the proceedings than were presented, so there's a lot more material there. And uh, a little bit of out-of-order presentation technology as well. A <laughs> uh, couple of questions with the uh, Onda interconnect, the loop. Uh, you mentioned that you could go in an optimal manner. Do you have basically what, counter, you know, a clockwise loop and a counterclockwise loop, is that how you do that? You can go either clockwise or counterclockwise depending what is the shortest path, yes. And on the uh, interconnect itself, uh, does the signal have to be regenerated at each station or is it just pass, go passively, go around and pull, get pulled off at the end? I don't exactly understand what you mean by has to be generated. The source where the request was generated knows exactly where it needs to go. It does not need to propagate, okay, I need to go in that direction. I don't know exactly where in every station. It says, does it, does it stay here, it goes on? No. But the generating one knows exactly where to go. But once it puts it on that loop, does it go from station to station until it gets pulled off at the, at the end is, point? It is pipelined, okay? I don't know exactly what you mean by station. It does not need any intervention in the, in the middle. There is an address, there is a station that it knows it needs to get to. And once it gets there, it goes to the uh, cache controller itself. But it is pipeline. It doesn't go there within one cycle. Is it store? Is it, well, is, is each bit or block regenerated at each point on no. that loop, or it just no. goes? Just goes through. Continuously. Continuously. OK, thank you. I had a question on your yes. L0 iCache. Um, how would you say that is different conceptually from that decode cache from the trace caches that Intel's had in the past? By the way, if you could give your name oh, and... Uh, sorry, Dave, Dave Williamson, ARM. Thank you. Um, it is different. It's different from the uh, L1 cache um, because it's decoded. It's not IA instruction bytes, okay? Yeah, sorry, sorry, I was asking how it's different from a trace cache. And it's different from a trace cache in um, all kinds of ways in terms of how you build it, where you can enter, where you can exit. There are similarities, you're right, okay? There are some similarities to the uh, P4 trace cache, but it's not exactly the same thing, okay? Hi, Jose Flores yes. from Texas Instruments. Uh, two questions. You mentioned that you were actually optimizing the type of transistor that was being used depending on the requirements within the same die. Mm -hmm. um, are you talking about using high VT threshold versus SBT threshold versus low BT threshold, or is something different? It's beyond that, which I cannot go into. Okay. <laughs> and the second question, you, you mentioned that when the core is idle, uh, it goes into a very low power state. What does that mean? Does, does it, do, do you power gate? Or yes. do you power gate with retention? We have different stages of power states, but yes, we eventually can go and power gate the core itself when we go to C6. Okay, thank you. Sure. Hi, this is Mujibur Rahman from Texas Instrument. Also, a uh, very quick question. Uh, you, uh, AV, um, floating point extended to 256 bit, but is it because of application? Why didn't you uh, extend integer also? Why didn't you extend, excuse me? Uh, 256 bit, uh, a floating point? Yeah. Extended to 256 bit operand? Yes. So only floating point, why is not integer? We left something for the next project to do. <laughs> <laughs> is it the application 
reason or? It, it was aimed for floating point and throughput applications, yes. Okay, thank you. Okay. Okay, one more question. Okay, uh, my name's Lam Ho and uh, I'm a Texas Instrument as well. Um, have you should a, have had a conference before and uh, sent one right. person. Uh, you mentioned that uh, you have some sort of hardware feature that uh, monitor what feature application being used so that you can uh, only save and restore the, the, the state that's being used. Could you uh, give a little bit more detail or example of that? Can you repeat that? I'm not sure I understood what you referred to what I said. Uh, yeah, uh, uh, a point on the uh, presentation is you have a hardware um, feature, I mean the hardware that monitor uh, which features being used by which application, and based on that, you only save and restore whatever register. Oh, oh, oh that's right, yes. Um, so this, it's not based on application, it's based on what architectural state was used, okay? And um, when we need to save the registers, okay, it depends on what architectural state was used and did we use all the full width of the registers or not, and we have different architectural states depending on what applications run. We don't know, we don't analyze the application, we analyze the architectural state. And we know how to optimize the context switching by understanding what architectural state has changed. Okay, well thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, we now have the second uh, paper in the series. It's Power Management Architecture of the Second Generation Intel Core Microarchitecture, formerly named Sandy Bridge. Uh, our speaker is going to be Ephraim Rotem, otherwise known as Effie. His co authors are Alain Nevet, Doran Rajwan, Avinash, and Athakrishnan. Sorry, I'll try again. Anandathakrishnan, Eli Weissman. And Effie is senior principal engineer at Intel. He's the power architect of Intel's mobile computing group in Haifa. He joined Intel in 1995 and was involved in the definition, development, and testing of various Intel processors. Uh, before joining Intel, he founded and ran a startup company in the area of data security and digital rights management. He holds 33 patents, uh, patents or patent applications. He's two times winner, he's a two times winner of the Intel Achievement Award. He has a bachelor's and master's in electrical engineering from the Technion. Effie. Thank you, Ellen, and good afternoon. I will uh, further go into describing the Sandbridge uh, uh, architecture, focusing on the power features and power architecture of it. The big, one of the biggest uh, pro, uh, the, uh, benefits that uh, Sandy Bridge has brought into the market was the ability to deliver state-of-the-art performance both on the general purpose computing and the graphics while operating in a thermally constrained environment. We were able to do that by a set of architectural and microarchitectural featuring, highly uh, optimized design, and as uh, Oded uh, described in some of his presentation, and tightly managing the part at runtime. The focus of my presentation would be uh, describing these power management features that we uh, implement on the run. I will describe the overview of the power management architecture, uh, a little bit into more details, the Turbo Boost technology, which does the active power management, uh, thermo, uh, active and uh, idle energy management, and a little bit on, thermal, on thermals and the uh, system view. By now, you know already the uh, details of the uh, architecture of Sandy Bridge. Um, the power management functionality of the Sandy Bridge is centered in the system agent. Uh, we have there a set of uh, a logic, hardware logic, and a dedicated microcontroller that runs a firmware that controls the power management features of the die. It connects through a, a dedicated power management link over the ring and to the system agent components, constantly uh, reading physical parameters of the different blocks, the cores, the graphics, 
the links, the, power, the memory controller, and does, uh, perform, uh, does uh, um, optimizations uh, in order to optimize the power and performance efficiency. It also communicates uh, through external buses to the rest of the system to control the voltage regulator and interacts with an embedded controller. And I will go to uh, more details a little later. It accepts architectural interfaces, the MSRs or MMIOs from uh, the operating system and other pieces of uh, software that run on the system and uh, control the CPU. We have um, two variable power plants on Sandy Bridge. One of them uh, covers the CPU, the, the ring, and the, and the cache. It is single power plant shared by all, by all the components, and therefore they all move up and down together and run at the same frequency. Each core has its own uh, power island that can be turned completely off using power gates. So when we go into uh, deeper C states like C6 and below, we just uh, save the content of the core into the, uh, one of the ways of the cache, and then we can totally uh, shut off the core and uh, save the leakage of the part. The uh, cache itself also has uh, power gates uh, for each, uh, each way, and when we go into C7 and below, we can turn off, uh, we can start write, validate, write and validate and flash the cache and turn off gradually uh, the entire last level cache, further uh, saving uh, leakage. Um, the gra this graphics has its own uh, variable power plan uh, and can run in a different frequency than the cores. Uh, when we go into sleep state on the graphics, we just shut off the, uh, the voltage through the voltage regulator without the need of power gates. System agent has uh, uh, many, many voltages for the logic and for the IOs, and it has a pro uh, programmable voltage, not variable as the other power plants, but with a, f with a um, hardware signal that selects from predefined set of uh, voltages in order to further uh, save power. The fundamental of the power management of Sandy Bridge is what we want to achieve is to maximize the user performance under uh, multiple constraints. So we have two parts of it. First of all, the user experience. There are many vectors to the user experience. Uh, there is the throughput performance. This is the traditional performance that all of the speakers today were talking about, running benchmarks for a long period of time, infinite period of time, and testing how fast it uh, performs. There is also in the client uh, uh, usages the responsiveness. Normally when we interact with a with computer, we do something on the computer for a short period of time, we expect immediate response, something to happen quickly, and then there are long periods of, of wait time, and this is the goodness that the user feels when he sits in front of the computer. Uh, also, there is the balance between graphics and, and the CPU. Sometimes we want graphics performance, sometimes we want the CPU performance, and since we are in a constrained environment and we cannot run both at a high, high performance, we need to decide which one of them get the, get the fit. On the other side, uh, not always we want to run at the maximum frequency, sometimes we want to balance it and, and compromise a little bit in order to get a different uh, goodness. Uh, energy. Energy has two, two types of energy. The active energy, while we are running and, and doing work, this is more important to servers and to desktop that perform long tasks. On uh, mobile, uh, we care about battery life, but battery life is more dominated by sleep state and idle rather than a continuous work. So we care about both of these energies. And of course, uh, there is the ergonomics. We, we want the system to run cool and quiet, and we don't want it to uh, consume a lot of power uh, at our choice. Um, the constraints, we have uh, as many, many physical constraints, and what we want to achieve is to get 
the maximum user experience until we hit a wall. And this constraint can be the ceiling on capabilities, voltage frequency, maximum, minimum uh, voltages, and so on. Uh, thermomechanical, this is what most of the speakers uh, on those two days talked about, uh, cooling capabilities, and so on. Power delivery, this is uh, uh, sometimes, or in, especially in this, audience has ignored limitation, but it is as limiting, if not more, than the, than the uh, thermal. Uh, and of course, there are the uh, software uh, controlled uh, accesses by the operating system. All the operating system has their own uh, power management algorithms that tell the CPU what to do. And since there are many conflicting uh, directions here, uh, and we don't expect to guess from the CPU, from the internals, what is the right thing to do. Uh, there are a rich set of controls that allow uh, the CPU, uh, they allow the external world to control the CPU. Uh, it is built in hierarchies. Uh, the upper hierarchy is the operating system, uh, graphic drivers, BIOS, all um, embedded controller on a client system, a node manager in the server area. All of them has a rich set of controls that they can, can tell the CPU, go lower, go higher in power, and so on. And from that below, these are layers that are reside inside our CPU. There is the uh, optimization layer that runs in a millisecond type of control. It constantly monitors temperature, power, uh, and other par physical parameters, and uh, does power performance optimization. There is the mission critical tasks that operate in a interrupt-like behavior when we need to do a C state exit or entry, interrupt respond, and so on. These are uh, handled in a microsecond kind of uh, level. And b down below, we have the hardware control that does the thermal throttle, uh, uh, voltage, uh, uh, VR, hot, uh, DDR, overheat, and so on. Let's go a little bit into the Turbo Boost technology, which da just does the active power management. Uh, in the heart of the power management, there is the power metering. Since we try to optimize power, we need to know what the power is. Uh, on Sandy Bridge, we have the third generation of power, power metering. We have implemented an event-based power meter where we collect microarchitectural events. We uh, apply energy costs to each of these events. We sum them together, and by that we uh, uh, calculate the active power of the CPU, the graphics, and the different fu functional blocks on the die. In addition, we have on each of our parts uh, uh, fuses that tell us what is the leakage of the part, and we uh, apply fixes for voltage and temperature on this leakage, and this way we generate uh, an accurate estimate of the power. The, this is very much like what we had on Merom about four years ago, um, and this is the basis of our uh, power management architecture. We also expose it externally through uh, MSR, so external um, software can read it, can display it, and use it for system uh, functionalities. Uh, I'll describe a little bit the, the uh, terminology of ACPI. Uh, ACPI is an, is an industry standard infrastructure for power management, and the terminology of P-state and C-state is, is defined by, by this uh, uh, spec. Uh, P1 is our guaranteed frequency. This is the way that we traditionally were specking our parts. Uh, we were specking our parts based on the worst case application that can ever happen on the CPU at the worst case conditions at ambient temperature of 35 degrees C uh, on the worst case part on the planet. And we guarantee that this part will be able to run at the frequency that, that we mark on the sticker. Since we are several years into the uh, power wall, uh, there is a lot of headroom to go above this frequency uh, when we are running only part of the cores, when the application is not so, is not so heavy. Uh, P0 is our turbo frequency, uh, which is opportunistically 
we run opportunistically when we have headroom available. Uh, Pn is the minimum uh, frequency, and this is where uh, the most energy efficient uh, efficient point to run at. And below that, there are mo more uh, states that are used mainly for, for critical events and thermal throttles. The operating system controls the CPU between P1 and, P0, P and Pn. Uh, based, each operating system does it differently. Most of them do it based on utilization. If the CPU is not fully utilized, then the operating system will bring us down or up as needed. And when the CPU is fully utilized and there is work to be done, the, CPU, the operating system will put us into uh, maximum frequency. And when we are put into maximum frequency, this is where we pass the control to the hardware, and this is where our algorithms kick in. This is how it looks on the, spe on the specification sheet. Uh, you can see that, uh, for instance, the extreme edition part uh, can run, we defined it as a 2.5 gigahertz up to 3.5. That meaning that this, the guaranteed frequency at worst case would be 2.5, but we have extra gigahertz of turbo opportunity that we can run this, the CPU when, uh, when we can do that, when, when there is headroom available. Same for the graphics. The graphics nominal frequency here is 650, and it can run almost twice as fast when headroom is available. A new concept that we have uh, uh, introduced in Sandy Bridge is the dynamic behavior of the thermals. Uh, Traditionally, we were considering a static model where we say this part is 35 watt, so it is never allowed to run faster than, uh, hotter than 35 watt. We know that if we stick, for instance, uh, in this example, 100 grams of aluminum uh, heatsink on the CPU, on the 35 uh, watt CPU, it takes him about 100 seconds to get hot. So for the short period of time, well, actually, pretty long period of time of almost more than a minute, we can run much faster, much hotter, and still meet the thermal requirements. So what we have implemented, this is the algorithm that we have inside the PCU. Uh, we have an exponential moving, uh, moving average filter that we manage the energy budget. If we ran, uh, you can see this, there the term of TDP minus P, P power is the measured value that we get from the power meter. We know that the target is 35, so if we run lower than that, we accumulate energy budget, and then if we need it, we can run hotter for a long period, of, for some period of time until we exhaust uh, this budget. Here, how it is, how it looks in action. Uh, if we were in either C state or run a very low load application for a long period of time, we have accumulated energy budget, and then when the operating system puts us in a, a high frequency uh, mode or request performance, we can jump to the maximum frequency uh, almost 20 or 30 percent higher uh, power. This is depend on the physical uh, parameters of the system, and we can stay there. Um, we can stay there for some time uh, until the, the heatsink gets hot. This is the algorithm that we calculate uh, the energy budget, and in this case, 30 to 60 seconds um, until we consume the budget, and then our internal function calculate the new powers, the new frequencies, and we gradually go down and back to TDP. The TDP can be at higher frequency than P1 if the load is not very high. We stabilize on the power and not on the frequency. So if we look at the uh, traditional way that, that power was specced in, in the past of a, as a rolling average of five seconds, we see that for a short period of time we can exceed the power but thermal, from thermal perspective, uh, this uh, is uh, uh, possible. Why do we need it? Why do we do it? Because as users, as human beings, when we sit in front of a computer, we are much slower than the computer in, in our actions. If we 
in this uh, example, if you open the picture, we want to do some filtering, uh, some action, red reduction, color, color uh, balancing, and so on. We push the button, we want it to act immediately. And then we keep on looking, thinking, and in between, we accumulate a lot of energy budget, but we want the system to feel responsive, and the dynamic turbo give us the ability to be responsive. We have all the controls exposed to external software in order to shape this uh, form or this uh, uh, behavior of the power. We have a, an MSR, model specific register, which is actually an architecture one, to control each one of the parameters. The power that is uh, stabilized to what we call TDP actually can be configured. If this is a 35 watt part, we can actually run it much lower or, much or higher as, as a control. Uh, the maximum power here that we call power limit two is uh, mainly uh, driven by power delivery capabilities. This is the uh, millisecond based power limit. And ma mainly uh, the limiter here is uh, um, often forgotten uh, components of the platform like the power supply, the brick, uh, all of these has limited power delivery. So we have the, the external control for the OEM that builds the system to tell us this is the power delivery capability of the system and we control the, the, control the power not to exceed it. Uh, and this of course is, is also programmable. It can be brought up and down and this is an OEM knob. Uh, the, time, the time at which uh, the system gets hot or, or cold is also a parameter of, this, of, the, uh, of the physical uh, dimension of the system, and therefore this is an external lobe that the OBM that builds the heat sink uh, needs to program into, this, into the registers in order for us to operate. Um, when we look at the instantaneous behavior, the, sh the shape doesn't look that nice. The, we can run, for instance, a low load, uh, wo a low power workload for some time, and all of a sudden the behavior of it changes, and we can jump in a matter of few core clocks from very low power to very high power. Our control loop has limited bandwidth, and therefore it takes us a millisecond or a few milliseconds until we bring it to the to the level that is programmed by power limit two. It is okay when we talk about the battery chemistry or the, volt or the power supplies, but when we talk about voltage regulator and power delivery, this is too slow. And therefore, what we do, we apply a priori calculation and we make sure that uh, we do not get to a point where we might exceed it. Power sharing between IA and the CPU. This is basically showing a sum of powers of IA and GT. Application may reside anything in between. When we want to apply turbo, we think, okay, who needs to get it? We can give either the power to the, to the CPU and get more CPU performance. We can give it to the graphics and get more graphics performance or somewhere in between. We have a register that, that makes the, that does the sharing uh, between the two, and externally we are being told uh, what is the preference of the user, either by a fixed policy or the graphic driver. Um, the, the power saving that we're, I was talking about up, up until now is the active power, and we were trying to push the performance as high as possible in order to get the performance. Sometimes when we increase the frequency, we don't get the benefit of it. We can run, we can run faster, but we are stuck on memory and, and the program will not run faster. So what we implemented is a, a parameter that calculates the, what we call a scalability factor. It looks at the memory patterns and make a decision uh, whether, how, how much performance we will be gaining from, uh, from the frequency. And when, uh, and based, 
based on this parameter, we choose how aggressive we want to be with Turbo. If we know that the scalability is poor, we will run faster, but we will not gain performance. We will not be as aggressive on Turbo uh, as we, were, we will be if, if the scalability is perfect. A re external register tells us what is our preference. We can go max performance, max frequency, or balanced. Um, quickly on the power management, uh, on, the, on the idle uh, energy saving, uh, Appleton now was, was talking about active power energy, meaning what is the consumption when we, full, when we run at uh, full load. Um, on mobile type of applications, we are dominated by sleep state. So we have a per core sleep, sleep state, C0, 1, 3, and each core of them can go up and down. Uh, when we go into C6, core C6, we flush the core and, and turn off the CPU. And when all cores are at C6 and are flushed, we can further go into package C state and, um, and lower, the vo lower the voltage into sustain mode. And in C7, we flush the cache and go down. And we have um, optimization algorithms to uh, make sure that we don't have too many uh, bursts of going in and out to C6, having the controller uh, manage the, the entry and exit to the, PC, to the C state. We can make sure that, that uh, the energy cost of going in and out of C state is mitigated in a way that going into the deep C state is always efficient. Uh, I will not go into the thermal management. It's in the material. If you uh, like, you can have a look at it. And uh, so to summarize what we are trying to do in the, in the Sandy Bridge, we are uh, pushing the CPU as hard as we can until we hit uh, physical constraint. We have left nothing on the table. We always run to the true physical limitation. Uh, we applied a rich user uh, control knobs in order for the external, uh, either, the, either OEM, operating system, or individual user uh, to decide whatever he wants to get from the system and optimize accordingly. Thank you, and I will take questions. Yeah, it's on, but it's not very loud, so if you speak into it. All right, maybe I'll just shout out. Um, I'm Dave Brown from the Solaris Engineering Group at Oracle. Um, can you uh, say some, uh, make some remarks about what the exit latencies are from C6 and C7? Uh, it, it consists of uh, res saving and restoring the content of the CPU and the uh, voltage regulator. The voltage regulator is a function of how, how low you go in and out. Yeah. Uh, it's a matter of uh, tens of microseconds. Tens of microseconds. Tens of microseconds for C6, a little longer for the C7. Oh, that's pretty quick. And is that going to change with um, uh, the next um, process tick, or is that a matter of off-chip regulation latencies the, right now? The specification of the off-chip regulator is uh, 10 millivolts to a microsecond. So depending what is your voltage span, you can calculate the ramp of the voltage. And other than that, it's the save restore, which is in a few microseconds. OK. And I got the sense. Sorry, it's just one more thing about C states. I got the sense that there is some automatic control now of C states. Is that only on the workstation class part, or does that apply to the enterprise parts as well? Uh, automatic control of what? Of C states based on utilization. You were kind of touching on that toward the end. The operating, that... the operating system puts us into, into C states. Okay. The Microsoft operating system, has, or the ACPI, is only three. And when we are put, and we can map these three to any of our up to seven um, right uh, until now. So um, basically, we are, we are honoring the operating system request. 
other than the demotion promotion algorithm that I only touched, if it's not, uh, it's not efficient because of burst of interrupts, we will keep us a little higher, and if it's more efficient, we will go lower and so on. But it's local optimization honoring the operating system. Okay, thanks. Oh. Okay, please uh, limit yourself to one question and nobody else online because we don't have time for more questions than that. And Andrei Slipuchin, T Platforms. Uh, I have two questions. Uh, the first one about. <laughs> yes, but you only get to ask the first one. I, I think uh, the first one is very simple uh, about the power meters. Uh, what is the uh, exposed to the software? What is the uh, sampling frequency and what is the tolerance of these power meters? Uh, the, what is exposed is a register. You can find it in the in the specifications. There is the energy per energy register. It, actually, we ex we expose energy and not power. So you need to sample it and, and take this timestamp counter and do the math yourself. We expose the uh, the CPU, the G, the graphics, and the total package. And if you subtract the total package from the total package, those two, you get the rest of the system. Uh, Accuracy, it's pretty accurate. Uh, okay, oh, no, but no. for the sampling, I mean... Uh, uh, no, no, no follow-up, we don't have time. Uh, hardware... Sorry, no follow-up. I, I we don't have time. After that session. Um, I, for all of the speakers in the session, I beat on them to put in lots more material, and then I told them, plan on what you're going to skip. So there's a lot of more material in the proceedings than they got to present, and if you trap them before they escape, they might be willing to explain some of it. Hi, Chris Chang from NVIDIA. Actually, I have a question about power metering as well. Um, do you use power metering for uh, mission critical EDP capping? We have, I mentioned two, uh, two uh, capping. Uh, one of them is the control loop and the other one is the, is the uh, microsecond. The microsecond is done by a priori calculation. We assume what would be the max current that will might occur if the worst case high power application will, will kick in and we make sure that we will not get into an architectural condition that this may happen uh, based on temperature, number of active cores and uh, microarchitectural features. So this is done by worst casing. For the PL2, the closed loop control, we are using it for the mission critical uh, and it has its tolerance but a reasonable one. I don't think, he didn't answer my question, so <laughs> did you, do you use it for EDP peak mission critical capping? For the, for the external brick, the battery, and the silver box, we use the power meter. For the load line regulation and the VR, we always have to take the worst case because even if the accuracy is infinite, the control loop is too slow. Thank you. Ken Wagner, PMC. Um, how do you establish the uh, P0, or conversely, do you close timing at P0? The timing? Yes, do you close timing at P0, which you uh, set as your max frequency? The max frequency is defined by the, the reliability voltage. This is the maximum voltage that, that the part can tolerate. And you're asking about the internal design targets? Yes, the static timing. Do you close static yeah. timing? Uh, this is something I cannot comment on. Okay. Jose Flores from Texas Instruments about the power meter again. Uh, do you use anything other than the counters, uh, digital counters, to, to predict your power estimation? And if not, uh, do you speculate about some of the process? aspects of the chip? Okay. Uh, first of all, you don't need to speculate. We have the information. We test each part at HVM. And yes, we apply also leakage. So we have a set of users that put HVM data into it, and uh, uh, we add this to the power calculation. Thank you. Uh, Fahim Aftab, I have a question regarding power gating. Do you guys use isolation circuitry as well, or I just shut it off? For the core, we, sh it, uh, we shut it off. For the cache, we have also the ability to run it uh, in intermediate points. Okay. Was that the question? No, actually, I'm talking about more like isolating the core so it does not you know, receive any more signals from the active cores. 
isn't that the, you are talking about the logic that we we stop the logic when we we talk? Yes, yes. sure. Okay. Similar to the atom, like the atom has isolation circuitry. Of course, whenever we turn off the core, we need to make sure that the, okay. the voltage uh, crossover and so on. Okay. Thanks. Uh, now, that was you just got online. We're we're done. We have to. <laughs> okay. We, All right. Sorry. So we we have to uh, move on to the next speaker. Thank you very thank much. You, thank you. Okay, um, we now move on to AMD. We have two speakers. Uh, the first one is a talk, AMD's Liano Fusion APU. Uh, Dennis Foley is gonna be our speaker. On the credits, we have also Maurice Steinman, Alex Branover, Antonio Asaro, Yubisa Bajic, Swami Punyamurtula, and Greg Smaus. As I said, Dennis is our speaker. Oh, actually, before I mention that, one quick announcement. Uh, John Sell told me that the, the people who bought printed proceedings should get them soon because he's going to pack them up before the next finish speaker finishes. Uh, so if you want your proceedings and you don't want to have to figure out how to retrieve them from who knows where, uh, you should get them soon. Okay, Dennis is a senior fellow at Advanced Micro Devices. He has more than 28 years experience in the computing industry at Digital Equipment and Compaq. You remember those names? Uh, he was design lead in the Alpha Server Group at Hewlett Packard. He was the implementation lead for high -end, the, the high-end Itanium server, a high-end Itanium server. At ATI, he was the chip lead for a game con console, Cost Down, before turning his attention to low-power design. First as the system architect for a licensable 3D GPU core, then as the system architect for ATI's Imagine Imagineon family of application processors for handheld devices. With AMD's acquisition of ATI, Dennis moved into the SOC architect role for a number of AMD's low-power designs, including AMD's Zakati and Liano APUs. Uh, Dennis is a 1983 graduate of the University, of, University College in Cork, Ireland, with a bachelor, bachelor of Engineering in Electrical Engineering. Dennis. Thank you, Alan. I don't know who drew, drew the straws to see who would go first, whether it would be uh, Intel or AMD. When I get to the latter half of my presentation, I think most of what I'm going to say is, just like Effie said, accept. And so we'll use that as the intro. Um, uh, so it's actually, we, we refer to the, uh, the codename as actually Lano. Um, so what's a Fusion APU? Fusion is AMD's uh, marriage of uh, graphics, multimedia, and CPU onto a single chip. Um, why do we refer to it as an APU and not a CPU? Well, we're, looking, we're trying to look at a bigger picture in terms of it's not that what differentiates now is not just the CPU performance, it's not the GPU performance, it's not the multimedia performance. It's the complete package and what we actually bring to the user experience is what really counts. Um, I, I believe actually, Effie, we also use the same graphic artist because we have the same sort of like, you know, shadow of the, uh, of the floor plan of the, uh, of the, of the die picture. So today I'm going to talk about the uh, APU architecture and the floor plan, uh, talk about some of the CPU core features, uh, a quick run through in terms of the buildup of what the, the graphics core consists of, uh, uh, expose the uh, unified video decoder features, talk about our configurable display and I.O. capabilities, and then we'll get into the slides that Effie and myself did together on power gating, turbo core, and, uh, and performance. Um, when we get there, you're going to actually be challenged to look for the differences. There are some but you're going to be challenged to look for them. So architecture and floor planning. So the, um, the A-series, the, the Lano chip, uh, contains four of our STARS 32 nanometer uh, cores. The 32 nanometer core is a derivation from the STARS 45 core with some pretty significant IPC changes, and I'll get into some of those changes in just a minute. Each of the cores features its own an individual uh, L L one megabyte L2 cache. We have an integrated north bridge that you know, connects the processors to two 64-bit channels of up to 1866 DDR3 memory. We support 24 lanes of PCIe Gen 2. Uh, four of those are used for connectivity to the uh, Fusion Control Hub, otherwise known as the South Bridge. Uh, four are used for general purpose ports. And 16 are actually used for graphics expansion, should it be required, or for uh, display purposes. We have two by four display port uh, dedicated uh, display links. We got a two-head display controller. Uh, we have uh, the UVD, the Unified Video Decoder um, 
uh, multimedia acceleration engine. We have a graphics core, which contains the 400 AMD radio units, and I'll be talking uh, further about that. Graphics memory controller, which services requests from the, uh, from the graphics core, from the unified video decoder, from the display, and pipes them through to the, uh, to the uh, north bridge and onto memory. And then um, I'm going to introduce the concept of two new internal buses, the uh, Fusion Control Link, the FCL, which is this, this bus here, and then the Radeon Memory Bus here, which is the graphics memory controller uh, interface to the, uh, to the um, north bridge. The chip itself is implemented in 32 nanometer SOI technology. It's uh, 227 millimeter squared and has 145 billion transistors, or I'm sorry, well, 1.45 billion transistors. Yeah. <laughs> I think there was a chip this morning that had 145. <laughs> so the internal buses. So the Fusion Control Link um, is, is analogous to sort of what would have been the hypertransport link in our chipset uh, space. It's 128 bit wide, wide in each direction. It's a variable clock speed based on uh, throughput. So if we have low bandwidth activity on the bus, we'll actually lower speed down. Um, if we hire, we raise it up. Um, its, its primary function is for CPU access to I.O. and for I.O. access to, uh, to memory. Um, secondary functions would be GPU access to coherent memory space and CPU access to the dedicated CPU or a GPU frame buffer. And uh, those paths are not optimized for you know, very high performance. There's some performance there, but that's not actually the primary sort of performance mode for the uh, Fusion Control Link. The AMD Radeon Memory Bus is, um, is analogous to a, a direct connect graphics memory. So basically what we're trying to do here is we're trying to expose as much of the system memory bandwidth as possible to the, uh, to the, to the graphics uh, clients, to the graphics and multimedia clients. Um, so what we have implemented is a 256-bit in each direction, so a 256-bit read, 256-bit write bus for each memory channel for a total of uh, 124 bits of, uh, in, of, of connect between the GMC and the memory. And that, that's easily enough, actually, to expose the full bandwidth, the full sort of like 29 gigabytes per second bandwidth that we can get from an 1866 memory. Um, the, the one thing about the Radeon memory bus is that it, I'm going to back up here for a second, the radio memory bus plugs into the back end of the DRAM controller, bypassing all of the coherent mechanisms, so it doesn't actually generate coherent probes up to the processor. Um, the GMC presents a very well-ordered stream of DRAM-friendly access, you know, a DRAM-friendly access pattern to the memory, and so you know, it's, it's a very highly efficient uh, bus structure. If I'll turn towards the floor plan, and I'm just going to run through this quickly, basically have the four star 32 CPU cores. Oops, not that quickly. The, uh, the four L2s, um, uh, then, then sort of all sort of like collapsing in onto the north bridge, which is sending traffic out to the DDR3 memory channels. Um, you can see a significant portion of the chip is dedicated towards graphics, display, and I.O. control. It's a 50-50 you know, blend. Just you know, showing just how important we actually think the sort of like combined model of x86 compute and GPU compute is moving forward. Then we have the unified video decoder, the media accelerator block, uh, display uh, digital interfaces, and the DPLLs to allow for sort of like the low jitter interconnect there, and then the 24 lanes of PCIe uh, interconnect. So overall, you know, again, 227 uh, square millimeters uh, chip. All right, so getting into the CPU features, so some of the IPC changes. So um, we've introduced a 64K iCache, it's two-way iCache, 64K dCache. Uh, we've increased the size of the L2. Again, it's a dedicated L2 per core from 512 to one megabyte. Uh, we have an instruction pointer-based hardware prefetch that I'm gonna talk about in the next slide. Larger instruction window, similarly I'm talking about that in the next slide. And we've had, we have a host of other improvements, including floating point scheduling enhancements, uh, improved instruction packing, uh, increasing the capacity of the, uh, the, the, the L2 DTLB, lower latency translation table uh, um, walks, uh, more aggressive store to, lower for, store to load for, uh, forwarding. And then very important for us for, for battery life is the uh, CPU parking support, and then the AMD Turbo Core technology support, which we'll be talking to in a later half of the presentation. So the instruction pointer-based uh, hardware prefetcher trains on a stride or regional data access pattern associated with an operation at a particular instruction pointer. So 
Alan and myself, when we were reviewing the slides, had sort of like, and we were talking about this concept of the non-striding address. It prefetches on a cluster of non-striding addresses, so it doesn't have to be a stride. We'll actually figure out what the address pattern needs to be, or what the address range is that we're actually trying to uh, prefetch. And that will be uh, triggered by a, a data cache miss from a specific instruction. Um, it tracks a wider range of strides than we did on the STARS 45 on, on the predecessor core, and it works in conjunction with that hardware uh, prefetcher so that we, you know, we actually uh, maximize performance. The larger instruction window, um, we have instruction level parallelism um, improvements through uh, by uh, increasing the size of the, uh, of the reorder buffer. Um, we added 12 more micro-ops to the reorder buffer, bringing it up to a total of 84 micro-ops. And we've got six more micro-ops added in the reservation stations for uh, 30 micro-ops total. And then in, in terms of uh, increasing the memory, memory level parallelism, uh, the low store queues can actually handle six more in-flight memory ops uh, up to a total of 52 memory ops total. So turning your attention to the graphics core, what I wanted to do was sort of focus in on what the fundamental building block of the graphics core is, and I'm not going to get into too much details of the overall sort of like graph, you know, graphics engine. So the fundamental building block is this what we refer to as the Radeon VLIW5 core. It features four uh, stream cores and one special function stream core a branch unit and a, and a GPR per one of these building blocks. So the four cores are, are capable, uh, the four cores plus the special function core are capable between them of a peak throughput of 10 flops per cycle. Um, so if, and, and then, you know, we consider sort of like a, what we also have in there based on our, our, our relative to our previous cores, um, we have increased the, uh, the IPC, we got more flexible dot products, co-issued model and dependent add in a single clock. We've added a sum of absolute uh, differences uh, instruction, which is a, gives us a, 12, uh, a 12x 12 speed up over, over the previous uh, mode. And that's used for video encoding for computer vision. Um, these are all you know, exposed via open CL extensions. And then for DX11 support, for DirectX11 support, we actually have the bit level op supported, the bit count, insert, extract, et cetera. If we look at how this sort of like gets built up, um, if you're sort of starting over in the corner here, just in case you're missing it, this is one of the stream cores. So we combine 16 of these stream cores to form a single SIMD, single instruction multiple data processing unit. And on the A8 version of the uh, LANA core, which is the largest one of the LANA cores, we actually have five of these SIMDs combining for a total of 400 processing units with a combined throughput of 480 gigaflops. Um, this is pretty important because one of the things that AMD is stressing right now is the compute capabilities of the GPU core itself. So, you know, it's pretty exciting when you look at the, uh, having on tap 480 gigaflops that you can use for OpenCL or direct to compute applications. And it's also a graphics core. So I'm not gonna work through this. Again, full DX11 support, um, you know, um, in the graphics core. Unified video decoder, the media accelerator block, um, is a combined firm, firmware, hardware, firmware schedule hardware block that uh, is used to work in conjunction with the application player to, uh, to accelerate uh, media decode. Um, in Lano, we've featured the third generation part, which is our UVD3 engine. And basically what I have here is shown the additional functions that we've supported in UV3 versus the, versus the uh, earlier um, the early versions of the core. So in terms of I.O. and display capabilities, we use the same physical PHY, the same sort of like PCIe capable PHY for both display and for PCIe. And we can run PCIe Gen 2 at the five, gig five gigabit per second range. So in our, if I look at it sort of from a display only perspective, I've got two head controllers that are driving six digital interfaces, two of them over a dedicated uh, DP only version of the PHY. And then the other four actually can be muxed on to the by 16 graphics expansion uh, links that I referred to earlier. Um, if I take an I.O. centric view of, of, the, of the arrangement, um, I have an I.O. controller talking to the PCIe controller here. This is a five by eight, refers to five addressable entities, eight lanes. Um, and the, that's, that's sort of split into four lanes for the uh, unified uh, media interface, which is the link to this outbridge and four for GPP. Um, on the other side, we've got a two by 16 core, which means we have two addressable entities, 16 lanes, and that can be split to serve, serve two by eight graphics links 
or uh, a single sort of like by 16 by 16 graphics interface. Any one of the links here, sort of the by four links, can actually be bifurcated, and we'll actually manage uh, link power on and um, um, you know sort of like uh, frequencies depending on sort of the requirements. So we can actually you know uh, switch back from Gen two to Gen one and so on. So power gating. All right, let's see if you can spot anything common here between these slides. So we have a single shared variable VDD rail for all our cores and caches. Uh, one thing that's different over what Sandy Bridge has is that we have independent clocking on a per core basis. Um, remember, the, the, our, our association is cache with uh, core, not, you know, not, a, not, a, not a shared uh, um, uh, last level cache. Um, we, have, we support C6, core C6, where uh, each core and its L2 can be independently power gated. That's, a new, that's an OS initiated event. The OS will either go to a halt state or will actually explicitly request a, a deeper C state. And our microcode engine intercepts that and actually turns it into a handshake between the power management system in the, in the North Bridge and the, uh, and the microcode itself. The, L2, the L1 and L2 caches are flushed and saved to system memory. Um, the CPU context, the x86 context, is, is also swapped out into memory. Uh, CPU clocks are stopped and power gate, powers are moved using uh, uh, core power gating. Um, we have the concept also of package C6. That's when all cores are in CC6. Um, we have the opportunity at that point to actually further reduce uh, VDD. So the reason we want to reduce VDD at that stage is there's some inefficiency associated with power gating. There's still actually some leakage in the, in the sort of power gating FET state, FET piece itself. Um, and, and we'll actually want to sort of like lower the voltage even further to totally eliminate any leakage there. The reason we wouldn't turn it off all the way is because there's some energy involved in terms of powering up the motherboard capacitance. So if you do this very frequently, like if we had in the case of like a, um, a one millisecond media timer, you'd be you know, cr cranking up and down the motherboard capacitance. And that, that represents sort of a, uh, a, a measurable uh, load um, on, on, on the power supply. Um, we have activity monitors that sort of are smart enough to try and figure out, is it, is it prudent to go into C6 at this stage? And I have more on those in just a minute. And uh, someone asked a question earlier about the sort of like the recovery times, 30, 30 microseconds from a CC6 state, and approximately 100 microseconds to get back from the package C6 state. And the additive distance, the difference there is the voltage regulator change. The way we implement the core, uh, uh, CPU core and L2 power gating is through VSS isolation. We basically create a frame of power FETs around the core in cache and using, uh, and, and sort of like we basically turn that on and off to isolate the ground plane of the, of the core um, from, from, the, uh, from, the from the rest of the ground plane on the, um, on, on, in, in, on the die. We also supplement that by having this concept of a virtual ground plane in the package as well. So the power FETs essentially stitch together the real and virtual grounds in the package and on the die. Um, so, um, and additionally, uh, to control sort of like inrush currents when we turn something back on, we have this mother-daughter arrangement where we basically uh, power up the core gradually using sort of like, you know, weaker FETs and then supplement them in a time-based manner with a higher powered FET to actually give us a lower resistance, uh, you know, sort of on characteristics. So the power gating monitors, as I said, the C6 exits, you know, 30 microseconds or 100 microseconds. So um, we can lose power, uh, we can lose performance, you know, if we end up sort of like diving into C6, you know, too frequently. Um, so basically what we do is we monitor things like, uh, you know, does this outbridge actually, does the, does the fusion controller hub actually want us to go into C6 at the moment or does it, does it have reasons to prevent us from doing that? Is there any DMA, acti DMA activity in flight? Uh, Non-C0 residency and C0 residency is kind of a metric for how well did we do the last couple of times that we went into C6? Are we, you know, are, you know did, was it the right decision or not? Is there a timer interrupt due? Clearly, we don't want to sort of, you know, put everything to sleep only to wake it up immediately to handle a, uh, a timer interrupt. And then basically, based on the system interrupt rate, we'll figure out whether, you know, what we should be doing there. Um, so basically, this power gating control policy, you know, factors into the decision after the OS has actually requested us to go to the C state to figure out whether we should actually apply power gating or whether we should just divide the clocks down, get into a lower powered state, but not actually sort of part of the chip down. On the bottom here, we basically sort of, you know, have this sort of like normalized, you know, without power gating, there's a performance, core power, and performance per watt. And we basically went through a, a you know, a suite of sort of like, you know, different modes of, you know, weights on these things here to try and figure out what's the maximum performance per watt 
and the minimum, uh, you know, power or the minimum performance loss associated with enabling C6. In terms of GPU power gating, um, one of the things that we do for uh, the, the GPU power gating, which is really interesting, is uh, it's, it's, it's basically, it doesn't involve the driver at all. Um, what we'll do is we, we have monitors that actually figure out that we have been idle for a particular period of time. And this can happen quite often if a graphics is rendering sort of like a frame to the screen, and it's a pretty simple frame, then I may have you know, another 25 milliseconds of inactivity before I actually have to go off and sort of like generate another frame. So um, we, we have timers that'll figure out that, hey, we're not doing anything. Let's, let's you know, sort of like power gate the whole GPU core. Um, and we have basically uh, also um, a static configuration to allow us to turn off the UVD engine. So it's, a, uh, it's, it's you know, basically the driver is going to figure out, yes, um, you know, I, I need the UVD engine or not. The graphics memory controller can also be dynamically power gated. Uh, so basically, if the memory is in self-refresh, it allows us to actually power down, power down the, uh, the, the graphics core. And then because the BI-16 uh, uh, interface to graphics um, may not be used or the display capability of those ports may not be used, we'll actually shut off the PCI controller and um, we'll do that again statically based on, you know, a bias decision, you know, depending on what's hooked up in the machine. So if we look at terms of effectiveness, these are uh, Meridian photon recombination shots of the die on a tester. And basically sort of like the, the, the brightness here is an indication of leakage of the part. There's no clocks running at this point. There's like a 30 second shot that's taken out of the die and we can figure out where the actual, uh, where, the, where power has been burnt. So on the, first, on the left here, the first thing we have is everything turned on. Um, you can see that on the, you know, sort of we've taken the UVD core and we've turned it off and you can see a significant difference in terms of the, uh, the emissions associated with the power gated core. And then if we look at the graphics core itself, and we turn that off, again, you can see sort of like the, the benefit of it. Okay, turbo core technology. So um, as Effie said, <laughs> um, we, we, you know, basically power and performance uh, vary a lot by workload. Uh, we design our chips to run sort of at a particular sort of, you know, again, you know, sort of max voltage level, and that, that voltage, you know, sort of cap sort of like determines the peak performance. We, we rarely have an opportunity to actually work at that power point because we're limited in any of the mobile platforms to, you know, at, uh, at you know, 20 something watt, 35 watt, 45 watt, 65 watt infrastructure that's called the TDP limit. That's the, basically a measurement of how effective the cooling solution of that plot platform is. And obviously, if you're running in a lower TDP limit, you have to cap your frequencies and your voltage to keep you know, sort of your, your aggregate power underneath that. We don't size for like, the power virus type application. Typically, there would end up being some D rate where we would say, you know, power virus we're going to handle through sort of thermal throttling. But basically, we want predictable performance um, uh, you know, above that. Um, but even, even if we set sort of to the, you know, 85% limit of the power virus, there were many, many, many programs, in fact, most programs, that actually don't use anything like the amount of power that we sort of, they don't use the amount of cooling cap capacity that we have in the chip. And so recognizing that, we have an opportunity to boost the part and sort of like increase the frequency of the part, increase the voltage of the part for that particular application. Um, the way we do this, is we have uh, distributed CAC monitors, CAC being the switching capacitance, it's sort of like the, you know, how much, how much of the uh, chip is actually active at a, or how much of the core is actually active at a period of time. So essentially we monitor events in the core. We have weights associated with them. Clearly something in the uh, integer core is not going to have the same import as a, an operation through the floating point core. And then we add in leakage. And basically sort of we munge all of this together and come up with a representation of the amount of power that's being burnt across all four cores. Um, we also have a power monitor on the GPU, uh, and so that GPU sort of feeds in there as well and tells us how much power we're burning. And based on if we have headroom, we'll actually end up uh, uh, boosting. Um, the, the, we have this concept, a similar concept of a, an energy margin accumulator. It's not, there's no point in looking at this on a cycle by cycle basis. You basically want to accumulate thermal credits over time and dissipate the thermal credits over time. If you have built up a lot of stuff, i.e. you're probably running cool, then it's okay to boost for a little while longer. One of, so, and the, the energy margin, by the way, is aged over time. So we'll take measurements on a regular interval and then we'll actually, you know, 
basically slowly disregard the older, uh, the older um, measurements. So over time, we'll actually sort of, we'll bias it towards looking at the more recent measurements. Um, so one problem with that is that with four cores, when we're measuring all four cores, uh, we may actually get an overall picture that says that we're not actually burning, uh, we're not actually burning you know, more than the TDP limit. But in this case here, we could have one core that's running very hot. It could be very active, and the other cores could be relatively idle. The, the burning all of the power in one portion of the chip can actually be problematic in terms of you know, hot spotting and everything like this. So what we do is we, we introduce the concept of a, of, a, of, a chip, of a core TDP limit. Um, the core TDP limit can be a bit punitive, so we don't want to use that all of the time. If we look at the distribution of uh, you know, thread activity as a portion of active time, we see that most of the activity that we have is for single threads. So over here we have the problem where we have some cores medium idle and one core very active, and this would be an issue. But over here, if we have surrounding cores that are relatively idle, the 16 watts burnt on one, one core may not actually be an issue because the other cores end up acting as a thermal sink for the active core. So we introduce this concept of a power density multiplier, which allows us to actually modulate the, chip t or the core TDP limit based on the activity of the surrounding uh, logic. We're rushing right ahead because it, Alan's going to be coming up here real soon. Um, we have, you know, we've also got, we can extend that to the, to the GPU as well, right? So if, you know, if the, GPU, if the GPU isn't active, then we can actually, you know, direct a lot more power to all four cores and count on the fact that the GPU is a significant thermal sink and, um, and, and you know, use the power density multiplier across all four cores, uh, core TDP limits. Um, in terms of the TDP management, um, what we do basically is we allocate as much power to the CPU as we can, um, and then the GPU basically sort of like gets, you know, sort of it, 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 it takes over, you know, sort of like whatever, whatever, whatever power is there. I'm sorry, I phrased that wrong. We, we, we let the GPU have it at once, but if the GPU isn't using it, the CPUs actually get what's left. So if we have an idle case here where the GPU is idle, there's a lot of power available for the CPU. GPU low activity, there's a little less power available and so on. Um, one of, the things that this, one of the things that this allows us to do, um, we can think about it, is we can actually allow for a TP overage as long as we're willing to thermal throttle in this case here. Uh, let me just move on. So performance-wise. So let's just summarize the performance benefit of the uh, AMD tur uh, tur turbo core. This, by the way, this is a typo. This should be increased performance, not relative performance. And you can see that across a range of, of, of applications, we can get sort of between 5 and 30% uh, and improvement in performance based on based on using Turbo Core. Um, if we look at the IPC improvements and actually look at what they do for our performance, we can see that we actually have you know, somewhere between a uh, you know, 2 and 12% uh, benefit based on the IPC improvements. This is at a similar frequency to prior products. Um, I have got two seconds left, so I'm just going to focus on this over here, which is the uh, idle battery life hours. Um, so, you know, basically sort of like all of the work that we've done in this space has actually allowed us to have a, uh, you know, a, a very meaningful uh, mobile processor that, you know, fits very well into, uh, into a low power mobility situation. And that's it. Thank you. Hello. Hi. Um, Satoshi Matsushita NEC. I'd like to ask you the philosophy behind applying two-level cache instead of uh, three-level. Uh, I'm sorry, can you repeat the question? So you're applying the two-level cache L1, L2, yep. instead of three-level for other processor that applies. So what is the philosophy behind it? Well, it's a balance, right? I mean, um, uh, you know, you can, you can run any number of performance apps, and you can say, that there are some applications that are going to run better with a larger L1, a larger L2, and no L3, and you know, uh, ready access to memory. And there are some applications that will benefit from you know, a large pool of L3. You know, there's, there's philosophical arguments day in, day out, even inside AMD, as to which is the better approach. Um, the, the, the combination L1 and L2 is, is what we've been using. It's, you know, that's what we've got. Thank you. Uh, Michael During, Photon Wall. Um, there was a reason why for many years uh, the floating point unit was a separate cabinet and later on was a separate chip. Yep. And even then it got combined more due to I.O. 
limitations than to performance. And graphics has been sort of the same way. Mm -hmm. And the jump to HD, you know, really caused problem. I have the fastest NVIDIA system up until six months ago, it's being changed, uh, running SLI. You need two frames to play a video game, one to see a monster and, and one to pull a trigger. Uh, you can't do it without turning off features that have been standard for years. And this is in a separate, you know, two-board system. Right. Uh, all these systems that have integrated together... Mike, um, what's, what's the question part? The, quest the question is that... Uh, do you believe you have the performance that anyone's going to um, uh, use? Because typically they just plug in an external board. They don't even try to uh, run the on-chip. Oh, sure. I mean, you know, there's, the discrete graphics isn't dead because of this, right? Um, the, the capability that we have here is equivalent to a mid-range discrete part. Um, we allow for coupling this part in a, uh, in a um, um, you know, with, with an external graphics to supplement the graphics. But for the sort of like the, the, the typical user, the capability that we're given here with the integrated graphics, with the media acceleration, and with the quad-core x86 solution, more, is more than sufficient for a, an, an excellent user experience, right? Now, as a, you know, as a, a, gamer, three, a gamer is going to want more. As of three years ago is the problem typically with these. All right. Okay. Sounds like you're trying. <laughs> okay. Next. Todd Besnick, Quantum. Um, this question is half for you and half for Sean. Um, I'm asking two questions at once. Um, uh, two half questions or? Yes. <laughs> Parallel, two speakers. Um, I really want to use a GPU to, to speed up my workload in the data center. And I, it's going into a place that, based on the last question, may be questionable. Why, why not put it on the higher performance part? Um. I'm not, I'm not quite sure how to, how, I'm not quite sure I understand the question. But let me try. I mean, so it, it depends on how much GPU capability you want to, to use, right? I mean, we, we, have, we have basically, we've, we've addressed sort of like a space that, that sort of we think is well represented by the quad core five SIMD solution. Now, however, if you have a very, very heavy uh, duty, you know, um, 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 uh, workload where you can actually use, you know, sort of where you can actually expand out. Well, you know, sure, we can plug in discrete graphics or you can supplement let, it with discrete graphics. Let me graphics. ask the question a different way. I'm sorry, Alan. Um, I'm trying to save power in Google's next $5 billion server center. I think I could use a high performance part with a GPU on the die yep. better than what I'm seeing with these two talks. Um, I would invite you to check out our FSA, uh, you know, developers forum sort of proceedings, and we can hook you up with the right people. Okay, John. Hi, I'm John Wharton. I'm a consultant. Um, both this presentation and the previous Intel presentation go into a lot of detail on the thermal management issue of thermal mass and how you try to model the rate at which power is being consumed, where keeping track of the budget, trying to monitor. All of that seems, uh, it's fascinating, but wouldn't it be a lot simpler and more reliable and more efficient to simply monitor the temperature at various regions of the chip? And if it's not hot, if it's not too hot yet, you can run faster. And when it starts getting too hot, you have to slow down? Uh, so, yes. I mean, if, if we have accurate thermal sort of like measuring characteristics, if we can get in, if we can get to within sort of like the levels that we want, right, that, that's, that's a great solution. The one thing, though, is that people like predictable performance. And when we actually run benchmarks, we want to get the same answer when we run it again and again and again. And so having a digital power uh, meter, a digital sort of like power monitoring scheme, says that when you run the same application twice, you're going to get the same answer twice. Okay. And it sort of abstracts away the, uh, the, you know, the ambient or the sort of like whatever. One thing that I sort of like hurried over here at the end was, you know, we, we, because we're sharing the GPU and the CPU and we have a TDP limit, we can actually consider that TDP limit is kind of like expandable if we want it to be, as long as we want to fall back on safeties of, of, the, 
uh, you know, of the temperature monitors. But so it works very well in low ambient yeah. conditions, but don't try it at home when you put it on your down but, comforter. But the simulations yeah. are open loop, and for instance, if the ventilation gets blocked, you won't be bleeding energy as quickly as your simulation assumed, and the, the temperature could get too high and have the system melt down, I would think. Oh, so we certainly have, we certainly have distributed monitors where we have staged uh, pullback um, so we have, you know, variable, we have a, a lower threshold where basically we'll turn off all boosts and everything like this, and we have a higher threshold, temperature-based threshold, where we'll, um, uh, you know, we'll basically sort of like shut the system down, essentially, to prevent any damage. Okay, yeah. Okay. Hi, uh, Hari from Intel. Uh, question, uh, can you share the same page table entry between your CPU and GPU, and is the memory ordering model between the CPU and the GPU the same? Um, not on Lano, but that's one of the sort of like premises that we're moving forward with in FSA, the fusion system architecture. Okay. Thanks. Kevin Crewell, Lindley Group. So you implemented Turbo Core. Why not Turbo GPU? Why didn't you uh, add a mode where you could accelerate the GPU if the uh, CPUs uh, were not underloaded? Um, We could. Uh, we choose not to. We choose, I mean, so there's, there's, there's an element of characterization and there's a sort of like some time associated with trying to figure out, you know, how to slosh power around. Um, and, you know, basically what we have here is, is a unidirectional, uh, you know, power sharing and basically giving everything to the GPU. But yes, I mean, sort of, you know, come back next year, you know. <laughs> Thanks. Okay, well, thank you very much. Thanks, Alan. Okay. In, in case you're missing the legal disclaimer slides, they're all in the proceedings. Uh, no, nobody has stinted. Um, the, and by the way, after the last talk, there will be a closing remarks from uh, Ralph Wittig, so don't disappear. I think he has some sort of raffle or giveaway. Okay, our last talk is gonna be by Sean White, it's entitled High Performance Power Efficient X86-64 Server and Desktop Processors Using Bulldozer Core. I, I, I'm waiting for somebody to have a title of something like just Alpha or something. Okay. Anyway, Sean is a principal member of the technical staff at AMD. Uh, since jo joining AMD nine years ago, he's worked in a number of processor and chipset products and currently works as a system on a chip architect for the up upcoming AMD processor designs. He has 20 years of experience in computer design, having worked on mini computers, servers, and workstations at Data General, remember that name, the first shipping eight processor Pentium Pro based system at Axel Computer, the first shipping hyper transport chipsets at API Networks, all before he joined AMD. He has a BS in physics and an MS in electrical engineering, both from the Worcester Polytechnic Institute. Sean? Uh, let's see. Okay. This is, uh, this is what I get for asking the legal folks to help me with the title. <laughs> so um, based on the, the last three days, I think, uh, and last year, hot chips, I think everything I'm gonna talk about has been covered already. So let's try it anyway. Uh, so here uh, is a photograph of um, uh, the die that makes up the three products that I'm gonna be talking about today. Um, this is the desktop section, but it actually it's one desktop CPU and two server CPUs that I'll be showing. Uh, so what's on the die? Um, we have uh, eight bulldozer cores. Um, Mike Butler from AMD was here last year to talk in a lot of detail uh, about the bulldozer core. So if uh, you weren't here last year, I recommend you know, going onto the website, looking through his uh, presentation for the real nitty gritty details in the, in the core, but I'll try to cover some of the highlights. Um, it's a high performance, power efficient, AMD 64 core. It's, these parts are gonna be the first generation of a new family, uh, 15 hex. Um, the, the interesting thing about um, uh, this core design is kind of the atom that we build the, the parts out of have two cores in what we call a bulldozer module. Uh, on the die, um, in aggregate, we have a 128K. 
of level one cache. There's 16 kilobytes in each core. Uh, we have 256K of level one instruction cache. That's actually shared uh, between the two cores in a module, 64K uh, in each. Uh, there's eight megabytes of level two cache. There's a shared two meg in each bulldozer module. And then we have an integrated north bridge uh, with an eight meg L3, 16 way set associative. The north bridge controls two uh, DDR3 memory channels with ECC and four 16 uh, bit hyper transport links, which are you know, unidirectional transmit and receive. Um, so here's um, the, the annotated floor plan uh, on top of uh, uh, the die picture. You can see uh, the bulldozer module there. Uh, that's, you know, two cores with its associated shared uh, L2 cache. And, you know, uh, with four modules on the die, that gives us eight cores. Uh, our eight meg of L3 is made up by four two meg subcaches. We have, uh, uh, you know, this is the Northbridge logic that controls everything, you know, below the L L2 in the cache and memory hierarchy. Uh, on this side, we have the DDR3 phi. We have the four hypertransport phis around this edge of the chip. And then we have a little bit of miscellaneous IO. Um, at lunch, someone who had peaked early was asking, you know, why is there so much white space on the design? Uh, this, you know, anything you're seeing here is, is not actually white space. This is uh, typically routing channels that just doesn't show up well in the photograph. There's actually very little white space in this chip. And it's 315 millimeters square, which I thought was large before I came to the last couple of presentations this week. Um, I'm not a process guy, but for those who are, this is in uh, 32 nanometer SOI, high K metal gate from Global Foundries, uh, 11 layer uh, uh, metal stack. Uh, if anybody has more questions, I think I'll, I'll have to refer to the Global Foundries folks. So I'll skip over that. So let me cover a few highlights in the, in the bulldozer core. Uh, and, and this is um, you know, largely copied from Mike Butler's presentation last year. Uh, so as I said, the, the gist of what AMD is trying to do, the core, uh, do with the core is use the area and the power as efficiently as possible uh, that, that we're given. Uh, so what the bulldozer architects did is they went and looked at, you know, what functions are, are really utilized and how are they utilized, you know, in x86 execution. And what they found is, there are certain functions that you can see are, are basically running all the time. You know, you, you know, they need to be dedicated. You know, if you've got an x86 core, you know, that stuff is going all the time. You know, the, uh, the energy pipelines, the level one data cache, you know, for each core, you know, those are there. What they, what they also found, you know, analyzing traces and, and different things um, was that there were a lot of things that could be shared. You know, for example, the floating point. You know, not every piece of software running on a multi-core system is using the floating point at the same time. Um, you know, similarly, caches can be shared. In, in this uh, design, we choose to share the level two cache and, and the I caches. Um, so what they did is to say, okay, instead of having, you know, laying down two cores and, and you know, being tight on our, on our area budget, can we save on the same area that, that two cores would take share the functions that can be shared without compromising what you want the design to do and actually make the pieces bigger and higher performance. You know, for example, the floating point unit, you know, knowing that you're gonna be sharing it, let's make it to have the horsepower to satisfy two cores and when only one core is using it, it's a lot of horsepower. Uh, and that's, you know, that's the premise of, of what they're trying to do here. Um, so I'll, I'll go through these fairly quickly. These are slides from, from Mike Butler's presentation last year. Uh, this is the, the front end to the core. Um, it's, you know, fetch and decode, basically. This is a shared um, structure. You know, it issues to, to both of the cores in the module. The, uh, the integer portion of the core is separate. You know, for each core, uh, sorry. The integer portions of the module are duplicated. There's one for each core. Um, so, you know, register file, the, the integer pipelines, load store unit, 
you know, data TLBs, data caches, you know, all those things are, are replicated. Each core has, you know, full integer horsepower. Uh, the floating point unit is shared, uh, as I said. Uh, and, and also, as I said, this is designed to be a very powerful floating point unit. Um, you know, it's got dual 28-bit uh, packed integer pipelines for your, you know, MMX type instructions. It's got uh, dual 128-bit, um, you know, FMAC capable um, pipelines. So that's, you know, significantly more floating point horsepower than uh, the previous generation AMD cores had. And let me, uh, you know, divert for a second to say what's in here. So um, the chips I'm going to be talking about are, are very much um, like the um, Phenom and Opteron Family 10 parts that, you know, everybody uh, has available to them today. Um, but, you know, what, what are these parts going to, how are they going to look different from those previous parts? So, you know, everything that was in there, you know, things I'm not going to talk about, like virtualization, you know, all the, all the good stuff that, that's already in the Family 10 parts is also in this core, but, you know, these slides are trying to tell us, you know, what, what additional things are you getting when you uh, get the Family 15 bulldozer cores? So, um, you know, the first few things are kind of cool, but they're kind of microarchitectural things that matter to us hardware guys. They're completely invisible to the software guys. The software guys, you know, care about this. You know, they're getting, um, you know, the rest of the SSE instructions that weren't in Family 10. They're getting some AES, you know, encryption capabilities that they didn't have. They're getting, you know, the AVX instruction set. And as I said, you know, that's implemented in a very high performance floating point unit. Uh, so people who, you know, write new code, you know, to use these, these, you know, these have been out for a little while, but, you know, definitely the newer, uh, you know, cutting edge instructions, you know, we'll see a lot of horsepower. Uh, in addition, there's a few instructions um, that are unique to AMD's implementation um, that, you know, fill in some holes um, in, in some of the previous instruction sets um, that will also give people some, uh, some additional horsepower in certain applications. And, you know, if you're a software person, these, these are the kind of things that these instruction sets are going to uh, give you a boost with. Uh, and then just switching back to finish covering the core, um, you know, prefetch, L2 cache, these, these are also things that are shared uh, between the, uh, the two cores in the module. So let me uh, cover the Northbridge, trying to cover the whole SOC. So if you're a Northbridge person, this is your view of the world. You know, you've got a set of cores and, and L2 caches that you want to interface with. Um, and, you know, you're the rest of the system. You're trying to, to service the, uh, the request from those cores. So, you know, the interface to the cores is, you know, through synchronizing into, um, you know, system request queue and a crossbar uh, that connects you to, to everything else. Uh, the Northbridge owns the L3 control. Uh, the stuff that's in purple isn't, you know, this isn't particularly, you know, color-coded for a reason, but the purple things tend to be um, things our analog group, you know, delivers, you know. So the L3 arrays are, um, you know, custom circuit designs. HT and DDR5s are custom circuit designs. Um, you know, the, the logic to, uh, for the Apex, the interrupt controllers are, are out in the Northbridge, uh, you know, one for each CPU memory control and DRAM control, hypertransport link interfaces. Uh, this, you know, looks very similar to, uh, to our Family 10 parts, you know, from a functionality point of view. But um, a lot of things happened under the hood. You know, any, you know, there are a few things in here that have been, you know, tuned up. Q structures have been increased. You know, if, if people found a corner case app that, um, you know, was able to stimulate a bottleneck in the family 10 parts, a lot of, you know, little improvements have, have gone into the Northbridge to uh, make the family 15 parts perform even better. Uh, so I'll skip through this fairly quickly, but like I say, the system, uh, the SRQ and the crossbar is kind of the, the connectivity hub in the, uh, in the Northbridge design. Um, the memory controller is the synchronization point for, um, Basically, address, you know, it owns a hunk of address space. You know, anybody's trying to access that address, the memory controller is the point where you, you decide who gets it first if you're having a contention in, in cache coherency or, you know, ordering issues. 
you know, that's, that's been there for a while. That's, that's, not a, that's not a new architectural thing. That's just the way it works. The DDR3 uh, DRM controllers, there's some new things here. Um, uh, two per die is not new, but um, the, um, the support for load reduced DIMMs is new. The support for lower voltage DIMMs is new. And you know, they, um, the top end frequency will be higher in this part. So if you um, were looking to run you know, lower voltage memory for power, you know, load reduced DIMMs for more capacity, or just you know, higher frequencies depending on which package, you know, you'll, you'll have additional memory capabilities here that you didn't, uh, didn't have in the family 10 parts. In addition, uh, there's a number of uh, power saving features uh, that, that are there on top of the features that were already in the family 10 parts. Um, so the memory system should perform even better from a power perspective. Uh, the L3 cache uh, is another you know, significant chunk of the die. There's, there's eight meg of, of uh, L3 cache. It's protected by ECC, single bit correct, double bit detect. And it's, it's also, the space in the L3 cache is kind of the home for the probe filter. Um, so uh, for those people who have seen Family 10 server systems, the probe filter, when you're building multi-socket systems, filters out um, coherency traffic um, to reduce you know, uh, socket to socket probes. So if you were bottlenecking, you know, if, if coherency traffic was becoming a limiter in your system, the probe filter um, uh, eliminates a certain amount of probes, effectively gives you a memory uh, system bandwidth upgrade uh, it, you know, for most applications. Um, the issue with that is you, know, you take up space uh, you know, one or two or four ways of the L3 when you turn on the probe filter. You know, we steal some space from the L3 to, to filter probes. Uh, the hypertransport links, um, uh, most of this is the same as it was in the family 10 parts. Um, you know, those of you who are familiar with hypertransport, uh, you know, 16-bit links. Um, what you get, you know, varies depending on, you know, which package you're using, what chipset you're using, you know, the quality of your printed circuit board. But, you know, at, at the peak, you can get up to 6.4 gigatransfers per second. And then depending on the package, you know, you have a single link, three links, or four links. Um, you know, system-wise, it's, it's highly reliable. It'll, it'll retry packets if a CRC error is seen. Um, you know, works very well. And, and obviously, we tried not to burn any excess power there either. Uh, power management, I'll probably skip through fairly quickly because a lot of this has been covered by other people's presentations and, and the stuff I would say would be very similar. Um, uh, but the, the things we're trying to do to save power at, at a high level are, um, you know, in the bulldozer core, just architecturally, you know, we're, sh we're sharing things when we can, trying to make sure everything is is utilized as best as it can. You know, we're reducing area to, to reduce the leakage. And throughout the design, there's extensive flip-flop clock gating, you know, dynamic circuits being uh, power gated. Uh, just, just numerous things kind of invisibly built into the design that, you know, at the software level you won't see, but it'll perform, you know, with much nicer, you know, power frequency characteristics than, than the previous cores. Um, there's a number of things that are uh, visible to, to firmware and software. Uh, core C6, which you know, our, our, my uh, friend Dennis just talked about for, for Lano and, and the Intel folks talked about in, in their chip. You know, it's very similar. Um, the core P states, AMD Turbo Core, um, that, that was covered. Uh, APM, the DRAM power management features I mentioned. And if you're in a multi socket system, you know, message triggered C1E to you know, manage power and, and bringing up and down links in, the, in a multi-socket system. Uh, so I'll skip through this fairly quickly. Uh, I guess the one thing I'll say is the, you know, the, the details that are in Lano are, are basically the same here. You know, we have a, a, a power gate around the bulldozer module, so that's around two cores. And when we want to um, bring those cores down, you know, we dump our state out to memory and then you know, tell the, uh, the power management logic to basically disconnect the, the core's uh, ground from the package ground. And you know, on the CC, you know, when you exit CC6, 
uh, similar thing. You know, you, you gradually, you know, charge up that cap that is the bulldozer core again, and then, you know, when it's really there, turn on the, the big FETs, you've got power again, you reload state, and then you start executing. You return to your service you interrupt or whatever woke you up. Um, P states, uh, I think we've covered this to death in the, pr in the previous presentations. Uh, you know, the gist of it, you know, this, this curve is, you know, is the thing we're trying to optimize to. You know, if this is your real limit, typically this, you know, is either your worst case power virus or maybe it's, uh, you know, a D rate from your power virus. And if a real application is below that line, then, you know, you have opportunities to boost your frequency to, to take advantage that, of the fact that you're below the limits. Um, you know, this is a, you know, illustration of, you know, what, you know, ideally happens when you, when you have eight cores. You know, if, if your application is one of the ones that, you know, says you have this, this headroom between where you really are and where the, the thermal limits really are, then you can boost everything. And, you know, in the case where CC6 has helped you out by turning off half the cores, you can probably boost further. And, you know, this is, this is what people will see um, when these parts come out. So let me, uh, let me talk about what the, what the actual parts are going to be. So the, the first one uh, is going to be an AM3 Plus uh, processor. This uh, called Zambezi. Um, this is the desktop part. Um, so it, it looks very similar to the AM3 part. Uh, the differences, you know, to highlight uh, versus the, the previous AM3 designs. Uh, it's got a little higher, um, you know, DDR and hypertransport voltage uh, current requirements. Uh, basically, you know, this has got to support a uh, higher frequency than AM3 uh, supported. You know, we go up to 5.2, and that, that's above the limit of the, the AM, AM3 infrastructure. Um, the DDR goes up to 1866, and that's also higher than the, the AM3 infrastructure. Um, uh, it is, you know, kind of cross-compatible. You can buy an AM3 Plus motherboard today, plug an older AM3 processor into it, you know, it'll work just fine. When Zambezi ships, you'll be able to plug Zambezi in. It'll work just great. Um, two memory channels, single HT link, you know, the 900 series chipset. Okay, here's, uh, this is a server processor for one or two socket service. This is our low end uh, of, uh, of our server space. Uh, it's called Valencia. It's a LAN grid array. So, this part um, is uh, basically the, the Family 10 parts or the 4000 series that are out today. And the story here um, is that, you know, you'll upgrade your BIOS on your 4000 series motherboard. You'll unplug your Family 10 part. You'll plug in your Family 15 Valencia and everything works. So um, you know, these are the, the memory capabilities you have, uh, you know, unbuffered, registered, load reduced DIMMs up to DDR3, 1600. Uh, you have three hypertransport links. Um, let me show you, you know, here's a typical system diagram you might have if you had uh, um, uh, a two socket system, you know, hypertransport links here, hypertransport links to the chipset, PCI Express hanging off your chipset, you know, with, uh, with the eight core bulldozer die uh, that, that we're delivering, you know, this gives you up to 16 cores in a two socket system. Valencia is meant to be, you know, very power and cost and area efficient. So if you're building something very small and dense, but need, you know, a server quality, um, you know, 4000 series CPU, you know, this is what Valencia will give you. Uh, Here's the largest package. This is uh, the G34. This is for one to four socket systems, uh, the Interlagos part. Uh, and this is the, this is the high end of, of the server part. This is, you know, you want, you know, the most bandwidth, the most performance um, that you can get. So uh, internal to the package, it's two die in a multi-chip module. Um, this is, you know, for Family 10, this is the Opteron 6000 series that's out now. Same story. And, and I thought it was great on Wednesday that the folks from Facebook here uh, came out and 
talked about their data center, and they said the exact thing that I'm saying now. They said, oh, we have an AMD system, we use G34, and when you know, their new part comes out, we'll upgrade our BIOS, we'll pull out the family 10, we'll plug in the family 15, and then we'll start buying lots of them to fill up the data center. So that's, you know, that's a great story when, when customers can do that and the upgrade is, is that easy. Uh, from the OS's point of view, this is just one processor uh, with up to 16 cores in it. Um, you know, obviously, you, know, you double everything, you have up to 16 meg uh, of L3, you have four memory channels, uh, you do use some of the hypertransport links for interchip communication. So at the package level, you have four, uh, four links coming out externally. Here's an example of what, the, you know, what a four socket system would look like. You know, here's your, uh, your green is your coherent uh, interconnect on HT. Uh, you can see that you know, there'll be memory hanging off of each of these Interlagos chips. Um, you know, that, you know, the way that's, that's hooked up, every, every memory is at most, you know, it's either on your, uh, the chip you're on or it's one hop away. Uh, it gives you up to 64 cores in a four socket system. You know, it's great for any number of, of uh, you know, server applications. Gives you up to 16 DDR channels. And again, you know, you hook up the, the AMD chipsets. You know, there's, there's two here, you know, two here and a south bridge in this configuration gives you your PCI Express connectivity. And I think I'm out of time and out of slides, so I'll take questions. Uh, Bill Rash, Intel. I have a question on the L3 cache. Yes. Your uh, diagram showed the L3 cache connected to the system request queue as a single monolith. The, the layout shows the L3 cache in four separate blocks, suggesting they're perhaps more parallel. And then a later diagram showed the L3 cache on the opposite side of the north bridge. So I'm really curious as to how does the L3 cache work in terms of connection to the processor, and what degree of parallelism is there among all those uh, four, what appear to be four independent blocks? Yeah, and, and I have a feeling we'll quickly get beyond my, my knowledge of, uh, of the L3. But um, there are, uh, basically, you know, there's a hash to, you know, decide which of the subcaches you're going to go to. You know, each subcache has its own connectivity into the, the SRQ and crossbar. Um, so, you know, there can be multiple cores going to multiple subcaches simultaneously. I don't know if that's... Okay, they, do, you know, they can work independently then. Yes. Okay, thank you. Nathan Brookwood, Insight 64. Another question on L3. It's a popular topic here. Uh, is it an inclusive or exclusive organization with regard to the L2s and L1s? I will check right after I get off stage and, and tell you. I, I don't want to give you the, the wrong answer off the top of my head, so I'm not... Not 100% certain, so I'll check. Okay. Hi, Brian Case. Um, I don't know if you can answer this, but is the payload for the, um, it, the payload that's sent to memory when the CPU powers down, when a core powers down, is that the same as like a VM exit or a VM exit payload, or do you know? Uh, no. It's, uh, you know, it's a special okay. uh, capability, you know, uh, specifically for CC6 you know, save and restore. So that's, it's done, you know, under hardware microcode control, you know, software can't, can't see this state, you know, it, it just comes out, gets dumped to a protected region in the, in the memory system, and, you know, on wake up, we'll get pulled back in, restore the processor to the state it was in, and then resume execution. Right, do you know how big that is? Pardon? Do you know how big that is? I don't, off the top of my head. Okay, and no, nobody else should get online, please. Go on. Uh, Jeff Huxel, uh, Intel. Uh, you had one bullet point on a message signaled uh, C1E. Do you know if that's for uh, triggering like a C0 to C1E or a C6 to C1E? Uh, I would have to check. Uh, I think that's, uh, I think that's a, a legacy capability, you know, similar to our previous parts, so it wouldn't have C6. You know, this is the first 
server parts that will have C6 capability. Uh, Chris Sai, Intel. Uh, my question about the C6. Um, so both cores in a module have to be ready to go into C6 and will come out of C6 together, correct? Correct. And then does the float ever get powered off by itself, um, your shared float? Uh, it, it gets, you know, clock gated, you know, um, you know uh, as the activity is low, uh, you know, you'll, you'll not be, um, you know, clocking anything that, that you don't need to clock, but it doesn't get power gated separate from the core. You know, there's not a, there's not a. Separate fit. There's right. not a separate yeah. power ring around the floating point unit. Cool, thanks. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, you see two people behind me. This is, as you've seen, Ralph uh, Wittig, who's got uh, some closing remarks, and Amr Zaki, who has been our sponsor chair, who presumably also has, is up here for a reason. So we have, uh, uh, from one of our sponsors, a raffle. Uh, you may have seen the fishbowl in the lobby from Oracle. Uh, they actually have a drawing for a Kindle. And so we'd like to conduct the drawing right now on behalf of Oracle. So uh, Amr has been uh, interfacing with our sponsors, so I would like to ask him to um, draw the lucky winner. Looks familiar to some of you out there? Intel business card? Alan Baum. <laughs> and since we conducted the drawing right in front of your own eyes, you saw there was no cheating involved. <laughs> so I'd like to thank you for coming. Uh, you know, um, <laughs> thank you, Oracle. Thank you for coming. Um, we will have, uh, so Lance, our very busy person in the back room over here, he says he's got uh, time this weekend, he's going to uh, work away at the videos, and so we'll have the videos posted uh, as early as Monday. Uh, probably the fastest we've done uh, uh, since we tried putting on videos. Um, as you saw before, we have the presentations posted online already, and we'll have the videos posted in the same area as the presentations. Um, again, I want to say thank you to our sponsors. Uh, it really does help uh, to bring down the uh, costs of the conference. Um, they make up uh, probably 15 to 20 percent of our income, so that's much appreciated. Um, thank you to the program committee, Alan, Bevan, uh, for putting together another good program. I hope you all enjoy, uh, enjoyed it. Um, and then I have to always acknowledge the 50 plus volunteers that really make this show uh, run smoothly behind the scenes. We have roughly uh, 20 people on the organizing committee, roughly 15 people on the program committee, and we have roughly 15 to 20 volunteers that really whiz around and make sure the food is served, uh, 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 registration badges handed out, and so on and so forth. So much appreciate uh, all the effort of all the volunteers. And then, thank you. And we did a few things differently this year than in uh, every uh, previous years. We actually had the tutorials midweek as in on Wednesday, as opposed to Sundays. So you have a feedback form. Please let us know if you like the Wednesday format better than the Sunday format. Uh, we've so far seen that the tutorial registration was double this year than in previous years. So there's something seems to be right about that. Uh, we had student posters out there. They were quite busy. Uh, I think the students I've talked to, they have always really enjoyed interacting with industry. And they said, we've gotten more feedback and more interest than in academic conferences. So that's also quite positive. So please let us know if you like the student posters and then we shall repeat it again next year depend, uh, depending on your feedback. And then finally, we, we played with like table topics at, uh, at, uh, at lunch uh, and dinner. Uh, let us know if you like that format uh, just for focused uh, discussion groups. Uh, we can further expand on that as well in future years. So again, thank you for coming. Please give us your feedback. Just drop off the forms outside as you're leaving.